ongoing for the Great. Great. Thank you. <laughs> and then we speak into the machine. Uh, the machine will work if you light on, mic on. Okay. Thank you. have props.
The Subcommittee on Technology and Innovation will come to order. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's hearing entitled Avoiding the Spectrum Crunch, Growing the Wireless Economy Through Innovation. In front of you are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth in testimony disclosures for today's witnesses. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. In today's hearing, uh, we're going to be reviewing efforts to ensure the innovative use of spectrum and the continued expansion of the wireless economy. This subcommittee is uniquely positioned to address issues facing high growth industries, and today's hearing is a continuation of our series focused on advancing U.S. innovation. The U.S. wireless industry has been experiencing exponential growth. There are entirely new jobs and sectors of our economy, like the app market, that we never envisioned a few years ago. Our wireless industry is the most competitive and innovative in the world, in part because it has been able to operate under flexible, market-driven policies unfettered from excessive government intervention. These policies encourage mobile companies to compete by providing innovative, user-friendly services and offering consumers the best possible experience. Thanks to a cycle of innovation and competition, U.S. consumers win. In recent years, the number of active spectrum frequency authorizations at both the Federal Communications Commission and the National Telecommunications and Information Administration has dramatically increased. In fact, at both agencies, there are twice as many spectrum assignments now as there were in 1980. As spectrum has become more crowded, it is necessary to ensure that it is being used as efficiently as possible, and that we have the policies in place to encourage industry's continued investment and growth. Maximizing the yield and availability from this essential resource, resource will continue to help create jobs and encourage innovation. The U.S. wireless economy has experienced tremendous growth with subscriber connections growing from 38.2 million in 2006 to 322.9 million in 2011. Growth in data traffic has been even greater as modern devices such as smartphones and tablets are much more data intensive. This massive data growth exacerbates the strain on spectrum availability. Advances in technology have always kept ahead of the demand for spectrum, but now as demand for spectrum is growing more rapidly, the te technical advances need, needed may be pushing the envelope of practicality, at least in the short term. To ensure the future growth of this dynamic sector, it is imperative that research and development efforts continue to identify more effective ways to utilize spectrum. We also need to ensure that government policies are not creating impediments and that we are creating an environment where companies will continue to invest in new technologies. Our hearing today should highlight specific efforts by both the federal government and industry to address the spectrum challenges within our sub subcommittee's jurisdiction and to enable the continued growth of the wireless economy through innovation. We thank our witnesses for being here today and we look forward to your testimony. I now recognize the gentlelady from Maryland, the ranking member, Ms. Edwards, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling the he this hearing on the ways that we can address the impending uh, spectrum crunch. And I want to thank the witnesses in advance for your testimony today. The United States has long been a leader in information and communications technologies, with the majority of the top firms being American companies. However, in a sector that's all about the next big innovation, we can't afford to, risk, uh, to rest on our past accomplishments. Wireless broadband is expected to trigger the next wave of innovation and holds enormous potential to create high quality jobs and economic growth. For example, one estimate shows that providing an additional 300 megahertz of spectrum to wireless broadband uses will generate 300,000 new jobs and $230 billion in GDP within five years. Advances in wireless technologies also hold promise to benefit the public. For example, the use of mobile technologies for patient monitoring is expected to vastly improve the quality of patient care and reduce health care costs by as much as $6 billion by 2014. Smartphones, tablets, and other mobile devices are already part of our everyday lives. Consumers and businesses have learned to expect access to information at any time from anywhere. This demand has resulted in the rapid growth of wireless data flowing across our networks. In fact, the amount of wireless traffic has increased by more than 100 percent in the last year alone, and that demand is expected to rise by a factor of 20 by 2015. The only way to accommodate this growing demand is to increase the amount of spectrum available for wireless services. The incentive auctions authorized in the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012 will help to free up some of this valuable spectrum. However, if the United States wants to continue to lead the wireless revolution, then we have to make more efficient uses of our spectrum. 
Advances in research and development are central to the goal of freeing up spectrum for wireless broadband. Spectrum is a finite resource, and in order to improve its use, we need to develop innovative spectrum sharing technologies that allow multiple users to share the same slice of spectrum without interference or degradation of services. Imagine a mobile device that has the ability to scan across the spectrum, identify frequencies that are currently available or not in use, and send its communication without delay. Spectrum could be fully and effectively utilized under this type of dynamic system, but it's only possible through advances in research, development, and testing. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about the nation's wireless testbed capabilities, our current research and development needs, and what the federal government is or can be doing to accelerate the efficient use of spectrum in the development of innovative wireless technologies. I'm also interested in hearing more about NIST's plans for the development of a nationwide interoperable public safety broadband network. I'm pleased to see that the role for NIST that Ranking Member Johnson and I supported and advocated for in the creation of an advanced wireless communication systems for our first responders in H.R. 3642 was included in the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act. I look forward to working with NIST and to make sure that this effort is successful and that our first responders have the broadband network they need to keep us safe. We need to ensure that the United States remains a leader in information technology, and wireless broadband is key to making this happen. The United States ranked ninth out of the OECD countries in relation to wireless broadband access. We need to do all that we can to ensure that the global wireless revolution grows from American innovations and benefits American companies and the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing, and I yield the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. At this time, I would like to introduce our witnesses, and then we will proceed to hear from each of them in order. Our first witness is Dr. James Oltoff, Deputy Director of the Physical Measurement Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Dr. Oltoff has been with NIST for over 20 years, and as Deputy Director, is responsible for the oversight of all calibration services at NIST. Next, we will hear from Mr. Richard Bennett, who is a Senior Research Fellow at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Mr. Bennett has extensive experience in network engineering and is the inventor of four networking patents. Our third witness is Mr. Christopher Gutman McCabe, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at CTIA, the Wireless Association. Mr. Gutman McCabe's experience in the telecommunication field comes from work in regulatory mandates, licensing, compliance, and general policy matters. Our fourth witness is Ms. Mary Brown, Director of Technology and Spectrum Policy for Cisco Systems. Ms. Brown handles Cisco's policies surrounding IP-based technologies, wireless, and networking, and she has expertise in telecommunications issues and internet law and policy. Our final witness is Dr. Rungam Subramanian. Did I get that close? Oh, wow. Uh, Chief Wireless and Technology Strategist at Idaho National Laboratory. Dr. Uh, Subramanian also serves on the National Information Technology Research and Development Senior Steering Group on Wireless Spectrum Sharing Research and Development. Thank you again to all of our witnesses for being here this morning. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each. After all witnesses have spoken, members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. I now recognize our first witness, Dr. James Oltoff, for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Quayle, Ranking members, Member Edwards, members of the subcommittee, my name is Dr. James Oltoff. I am the Deputy Director of the Physical Measurement Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Thank you for the invitation to testify before you today on what has come to be called the Spectrum Crunch and what NIST is doing to advance innovation in wireless communications. Mr. Chairman, the administration understands the critical need to ensure that sufficient spectrum is available for wireless services. In 2010, the President directed the Department of Commerce through NTIA and working with the FCC and affected federal agencies to make available for commercial wireless use an additional 500 megahertz of federal and non-federal spectrum at frequencies near current cell phone bands. <coughs> Let me briefly discuss some of the research activities underway at NIST related to the spectrum crunch, crunch issue. NIST recently launched a five-year program to provide industry with the new sufficiently precise measurement methods and the channel measurement data it needs to lead internationally in the development of innovative millimeter wave wireless technologies. While the technical challenges to mobile communications at millimeter wave frequencies are great, the benefits of utilizing this large bandwidth at millimeter wave frequencies cannot be ignored. This new program will support industry with new tools for use in developing mobile millimeter wave wireless systems. NIST innovation and expertise applied to the challenges of higher speed wireless will offer new metrology 
so that U.S. industry can realize effective utilization of the entire millimeter wave region. NIST is familiar with the needs of current U.S. telecommunications industry through its interactions with the Cellular Telecommunication Industry Association certification programs. Additionally, NIST is leveraging recent funding from DARPA, with whom we are developing improved oscilloscope-based techniques to characterize millimeter wave receivers and also investigating the use of reverberation chambers for the testing of radiated power. We are also leveraging our interactions with the IEEE on standards for 60 gigahertz systems. This work will accelerate the modeling, design, verification, standardization, and interoperability of mobile millimeter wave wireless systems of the future, positioning the United States at the forefront of the competitive telecommunications industry. The ability to measure and also model components, circuits, and entire systems at higher frequencies and bandwidths will provide tools for more economical wireless system development that can take advantage of this new spectrum. In addition to more precise high frequency measurements, NIST is also looking at challenges related to radio frequency measurements and the spectrum crunch, particularly electromagnetic compatibility and interference issues. Work at NIST develops and promotes electromagnetic measurements, standards, and technology to support a broad range of technical needs. NIST programs focus on accurate and reliable measurements throughout the radio spectrum, in particular at radio and microwave frequencies. We carry out these programs in close coordination with our colleagues in industry, academia, and other government agencies, such as NTIA, the Departments of Defense, Energy, and Homeland Security, to ensure that we are responsive to their most pressing measurement needs. One of our primary goals is to extend new measurement tools and theories to higher operating frequencies, wider signal bandwidth, and smaller length scales. These are required for next generation applications in microelectronics, high speed communications, computing, and data storage. The President has recognized the need for further investments in this area. In the fiscal year 2013 budget request for NIST, the President proposed a $10 million advanced telecommunications initiative that would accelerate innovation in advanced telecommunications. This request would provide funds for NIST modeling and measurement science that would address key areas to enable significant innovation in communications in both the commercial and public safety sectors. Finally, the recently enacted Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012 contains a provision very similar to that envisioned by the President's National Wireless Initiative that would provide NIST with up to $300 million to help develop cutting-edge technology for public safety users. The overriding objective, objective of this anticipated funding is to build a broadband system to allow first responders and other public safety personnel anywhere in the nation to send and receive data, voice, and other communications to save lives, prevent casualties, and avert acts of terror. Such improvements depend upon advances in measurement science, modeling, standards, and testing. The technological challenges that stand in the way are significant. Public safety considerations impose demanding specifications including mission-critical voice services, enhanced security requirements, unique applications, and specialized testing needs. In conclusion, NIST is leveraging its expertise in measurement science and standards in a number of areas to help improve the effectiveness of wireless communications in the United States. NIST will continue to work with partners across the federal government, academia, and industry to drive technological innovations that will enable U.S. manufacturers to maintain their leadership in wireless telecommunications. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Olaf. Now recognize Mr. Richard Bennett to present his testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Quayle, Ranking Member Edwards, and members. I'm Richard Bennett, Senior Research Fellow at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation and a former network engineer and inventor. Spectrum policy is important right now because computing is undergoing a dramatic, some would say revolutionary shift from fixed location systems to mobile devices and applications. Smartphones outsold PCs last year for the first time, and that's a trend that's not going to reverse anytime soon. Last week, Facebook bought Instagram for a billion dollars, a, a little photo sharing service with only 13 employees. And this jaw-dropping price, $76 million per employee, was justified in Facebook's uh, point of view because Instagram had already acquired 40 million users in only 16 months of operation, roughly as many as Netflix and Comcast have combined, um, or will be by the end of next week. They're adding a million a day. So the mobile revolution marks a new era in computing, and it's powered by Spectrum primarily, also microelectronics and software. Another application category that we haven't heard much about yet is mobile augmented reality, a, a category of, of application that actually interchanges video streams from the user to the cloud in both directions 
to enhance the user's experience as he moves around, uh, he or she moves around in the world. In this picture here, you're actually seeing uh, images projected from contact lenses that have embedded electronics. It's a technology that actually been demonstrated, although only for a one pixel display right now, but you know, more and more of that's coming. All of these applications require spectrum, the more the better, and because they're truly mobile, there are limited opportunities to offload their spectrum needs to short distance uh, Wi-Fi networks. Um, so this, they, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a little lost here, okay. Yeah, spectrum uh, assignments by regulators around the world have produced this fragmented system of small assignments for a large number of, of applications like you see in this, in this uh, spectrum chart from NTIA. It, it reflects uh, what, from the modern perspective, it's sort of like the government's attempt to operate an app store. I mean, that, that's is really what this looks like to me. Because every one of these tiny little uh, allocations is actually for a particular application. You try to think about how that would work in the, in the kind of app store at the scale that Android and Apple run them today. It's completely, you, you can't even imagine it. But there's a technology that's embedded behind this allocation system. And it's frequency division multiplexing. And we, you know, we don't use that as, we don't rely on that so much anymore. We have packet switching now and networks and uh, technologies that go beyond that. So the, the, one of the tasks for regulators is to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, to take this spectrum map and to realign it so that we have a smaller number of allocations for larger contiguous chunks that we can use for more diverse purposes by running packet switching you know, on top of them. There are, of course, a number of technical tools uh, to enable us to, to make this transition and to get better use is, uh, is the ranking member pointed out dynamic spectrum access is one of those tools. Authorized shared access is a more kind of a third way approach as, as we characterize it between fully dynamic or fully unlicensed and fully licensed. It's kind of licensed to a limited number of players who can cooperate. But the holy grail ultimately that's going to resolve this problem in the long run is something that uh, we call simultaneous shared access. Examples of that are CDMA that's, that's actually built into all the smartphones of today, SDMA, which is spatial division, multiple access, and then multi-user MIMO. These exist in, in um, nascent form. They're not fully developed in today's uh, networks, and we expect to see more research making those technologies more robust. Um, many government applications are critical for first responders, as has been pointed out. I, I'm not going to go into much detail on that. Our position on the public safety network is it actually would be best for everyone if, for the most part, that application were recognized to be an application that should run on commercial networks. That position has the advantage of being um, disapproved of by both the commercial network operators and public safety, so I feel reasonably impartial in you know, making that. Uh, but the point is that, that focusing on technologies, we, we now can, can actually, through the lever of government and how investment and in research is, is channeled, can actually use the development of technology as a way to resolve apparently un intractable policy disputes. The, the policy dispute behind FirstNet was, you know, who gets access to that, to that spectrum during times of crisis because both the commercial and the public safety users, you know, want it and, and have, you know, good arguments for it. So to, to more or less conclude, uh, one of the topics uh, that, that is, I think, going to be central and, and certainly in the larger public debate about this issue, there's already some questioning about whether the spectrum crunch is real. Well, it's both real and an illusion, and it's simply a matter of the timeline. The, in 20 or 30 years, there won't be a spectrum crunch because we'll be able to use spectrum so efficiently that, that multiple streams of data will actually be able to move over the same frequencies at the same time but we're literally not there yet. And the research agenda is gonna, gonna help us to get there. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. And now recognize Mr. Gutman McCabe for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Quayle, Ranking Member Edwards, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for including me on today's panel. I'm here on behalf of CTIA, the Wireless Association, which represents the wireless carriers, equipment vendors, and software developers that are driving America's leadership in, in wireless broadband. 
I am pleased to tell you that the United States leads the world in the deployment of fourth generation wireless technologies. While the U.S. is home to less than 5% of the world's population, we have almost 90% of the world's LTE subscribers and over 50% of the world's WiMAX subscribers. The U.S. wireless ecosystem is setting the pace for innovation with ubiquitous high-speed networks, cutting-edge devices launched here first, and the epicenter of the applications world. Five years ago, for the most part, these capabilities didn't exist. Yet today, we are increasingly using wireless devices, applications, and wireless networks to shop, pay bills, read the news, stay in touch, reduce energy consumption, manage fleets of trucks, control inventory, address health care issues, and teach our children. Not surprisingly, mobile data service demand is exploding. Wireless data traffic grew 123 percent from 2010 to 2011, on top of a doubling the year before and the year before that. The pace of growth actually is accelerating, as the last six months of 2011 were 132 percent greater than the last six months of 2010. To stay ahead of this demand, CTI's members invest more than $20 billion annually, including more than $25 billion each of the last two years, to extend and upgrade the capabilities of wireless networks. In these difficult economic times, our members actually are increasing their capital investments. But even at these impressive levels, network investment alone will not allow us to stay ahead of the exploding demand. Conservative estimates project U.S. mobile data traffic will grow by more than a factor of 10 over the next five years. If vehicle traffic in your congressional district was predicted to grow by a factor of 10 over the next five years, you would want to know that the transportation authorities had a plan and were implementing it. The same should be true of Spectrum. For this reason, and to maintain the advantages that flow from our world-leading position, CTI believes it is imperative that our government embrace policies that will make additional spectrum available on a predictable, near-term basis. CTI urges Congress to ensure that the FCC and NTIA faithfully and expeditiously implement the spectrum legislation enacted by Congress just this past February. While we believe that the incentive auction process will bring a substantial amount of spectrum to market, that will only be a down payment towards the 500 megahertz that the FCC called for in its national broadband plan and that the President embraced in his memorandum on unleashing the wireless broadband revolution. In order to progress towards that 500 megahertz target, as well as to keep pace with the hundreds of megahertz being freed for commercial use in a number of European and Asian countries, additional spectrum will need to be made available. CTI recommends that the 1755 to 1780 megahertz band be reallocated and paired with the available 2155 to 21 megahertz band. Making this spectrum available in the short term for commercial use will not only benefit consumers, it will also add billions to the U.S. Treasury. CTI recognizes that reallocation is challenging, but spectrum clearing represents a substantially better path than a full default to spectrum sharing. While spectrum sharing may have a place as a, as a complement to fully cleared spectrum, dynamic or opportunistically shared spectrum currently is not suitable as a substitute for large blocks of cleared, licensed spectrum. It is important to note that carriers and manufacturers are aggressively using many tools to try and meet this increasing demand, including the deployment of smaller cells and the use of Wi-Fi offload. Notwithstanding these efforts, the release of additional spectrum into the marketplace remains the single most important thing that can be done to ensure the continued vibrancy of the wireless ecosystem. While spectrum policy obviously is paramount, there certainly are other factors that can affect the industry's continued success. In particular, CTI urges Congress to be mindful that regulatory and tax policies have a substantial impact on the ability and incentive for our members to invest in new facilities and the development of new technologies. In sum, while, while I believe the wireless future is bright, there's a great deal to be done to ensure that we maximize that opportunity and continue U.S. leadership in this vital industry. CTI looks forward to working with you and your colleagues on these important matters. Thank you for the opportunity to appear at today's hearing, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. And now recognize Ms. Brown for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Quayle and Ranking Member Edwards and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you about the dynamic changes Cisco is seeing in the wireless economy. Today's topic is the spectrum crunch. 
Crunch is a term intended to convey a shortage or scarcity of spectrum where demand exceeds supply. More poetically, crunch is the sound of your teeth gnashing when the internet fails to launch from your mobile device or you can't send that important email. Cisco, as a technology vendor, sees evidence of the spectrum crunch all around us, from our analysis of traffic data and consumer usage, to the technologies our service provider customers are asking us to develop, to the activity we observe in the spectrum market. Where is this crunch coming from? Simply put, from all of us. More and more powerful smartphones, tablets, laptops, and other mobile devices accessing rich data, such as video, are sending more and more information wirelessly to the internet. Cisco's US mobile data forecast projects that the volume of data traffic on mobile service provider networks will increase 16 times from 2011 to 2016. That's just stunning. So confronted with the exponential growth in mobile traffic, we believe that action must be taken. Additional spectrum must be found. Congress made a solid down payment earlier this year when it increased spectrum for broadband by authorizing voluntary incentive auctions in H.R. 3630. But more action is needed. Otherwise, it could limit and constrain the innovation, job creation, and economic growth that we all want to see. So what is causing mobile data demand to rise so steeply? First, consumers' use of mobile data is growing, and there is no end in sight. In 2011, 4% of users were generating more than one gigabyte of mobile data per month, the equivalent of downloading about six TV shows. But by 2016, 74% of users will be in the gigabyte club. Second, the data transmitted will be video in many forms, from YouTube, TV shows, video calls. By 2016, over two-thirds of mobile traffic in the U.S. will be video. Third, many more people will use multiple devices. In 2011, 8% of U.S. subscribers use multiple mobile devices, and by 2016, it's 25%. In addition, mobile networks will also support machine-to-machine -machine connections. So what do I mean by machine-to-machine? -machine? I mean smart meters to conserve energy, sensor networks to make our roads and communities safer, and home health care monitoring to reduce health care costs and improve outcomes. By 2016, there will be 726 million mobile connections for just 348 million people in the U.S. That illustrates the power and the impact of machine to machine. Fourth, mobile devices themselves are changing and driving new traffic demands on networks. For example, by 2013, smartphones will become the most dominant device type responsible for mobile data traffic. From 2011 to 2016, the smartphone evolves from an email device to a fully capable handheld computer. In 2016, there will be many more things consumers do with their smartphones than we do today. Policymakers, I believe, understand these challenges and are taking them seriously. In addition to congressional action, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration has just released its report on the 1755 to 1850 megahertz band, evaluating the cost and challenges of relocating federal users in that band. Clearing as much of this spectrum as possible is important to meet consumer demand for mobile broadband and keep the U.S. in the forefront of technology leadership. The technology sector, for its part, is also innovating quickly to try to help our service provider customers meet consumer demand until additional spectrum can be placed in service. New chipset designs, base stations and antenna technology, and network management tools are a few of the offerings designed to wring more efficiency from available spectrum. Carriers are aggressively deploying Wi-Fi and femto cells in an effort to offload mobile traffic to fixed networks where possible. AT&T and Verizon Wireless are deploying LTE or 4G networks, which are more efficient than the prior 3G technology. And carriers continue to deploy additional cell sites to reuse existing spectrum. But even with all these efforts, we cannot expect technology alone to solve the spectrum crunch. So what are the next steps? I encourage Congress to investigate specific spectrum bands that can be repurposed for mobile broadband and to realize that additional legislative action will be necessary. We look forward to working with you, the administration, and the commercial sector to identify spectrum opportunities, including in bands now used by federal agencies. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. And now recognize Dr. Subramanian for five minutes. Chairman Fowle, Ranking Member Ed Is your mic on? I'm sorry. 
Let's start again. <laughs> Chairman Quayle, Ranking Member Edwards, and members of the subcommittee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify before the House Science, Space, and Technology Subcommittee on Technology and Innovation. I realize the importance of this topic, avoiding the spectrum crunch, growing the wireless economy through innovation. I understand there is so much at stake for the future of the national economy and national security of this great nation, based on how we can handle the spectrum crunch today. My name is Dr. Rangaram Subramanian. I'm the Chief Wireless Strategist at the Idaho National Laboratory. In the interest of time, I'll discuss the key points in my written testimony. As everyone said here, wireless spectrum is limited natural resource, just like gasoline. There is exceptionally high demand, growing high demand, and there's low supply. Yet there is little unallocated spectrum available for exclusive allocations. However, wireless communication is a critical common technology thread for all the key economic sectors in the future. It influences national security, emergency and first responder communications, smart grid energy infrastructure, electric vehicles and transportation systems, advanced manufacturing systems, medical devices, and so on. So the demand for additional spectrum is not just restricted to the United States. Globally, the European Union, Singapore, and China, they're all experiencing the same issues, but they are also aggressively seeking innovative solutions and have established test beds that can be used by many people, and innovations and patenting is rapidly growing there. Which means, is the US, United States behind in initiating this effort in a larger way? Is this an opportunity time for gaining global leadership and taking hold of the economy, a, a global economy? Now, there are three key challenges to this. Solving the spectrum crisis and gaining global leadership in this country. Number one, a need for a national approach. It is important for the different national spectrum stakeholders to appreciate the crunches for real and sharing primarily or repurposing in specific cases, especially when it deals with national security, is extremely important, both on the government side and on the industry side. And everyone has to work with the national agencies to identify spectral bands for initiating research and experimentation in support of repurposing or sharing. Collaborate to build trustable, secure spectrum sharing technologies, as well as technologies in high frequencies. The government has initiated some important efforts. The NTIA and FCC have been trying to work, identify suitable bands for spectrum repurposing or sharing, and is also coordinating with several agencies. The recent Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, HR 3630, has also identified specific bands for sharing and repurposing. There are critical national efforts for example, by the National Wireless Spectrum R&D Wizard Senior Steering Group, helping effectively collaborate across the government agencies to develop an inventory of the research initiatives in the nation, as well as the testing facilities. However, there is a long way to go in terms of realizing what the spectrum is needed by the industry. Challenge two, a strategy for accelerated technology deployment, development. Technology development is pretty much in an infancy stage right now. There are prototypes going around, but that's not in a deployable form. Stakeholders, both from the government side and the industry, need trust and security in spectrum sharing. Secure technologies, standardization, experimentation, and business models are extremely critical if sharing has to become successful. The wireless carriers, equipment manufacturers, devices, and application vendors they're all not showing very keen interest in developing sharing technologies because it is not showing immediate return on investment. Now, entrepreneurs are building prototypes. The DOD labs have a, a pretty broader portfolio of research. Other national laboratories have lack of funding. The academic institutions have a lot of research going on, but more on theoretical basis. They do not have the necessary funding. For example, the NSF ES program is lacking funding, and they do not have realistic national test beds where they can go and really test it. So this is a widespread problem across different people who are in developing the technologies right now. Also, research on wireless cybersecurity is extremely critical. We have done this mistake with the wireline security, and we cannot afford to do this going forward. Now, secondly, standardization of the spectrum sharing technology is in its infancy. There are limited efforts going on, 
one by the lack of technology, second by the understanding of the technology, where experimentation and data sets are really important before you can standardize. So that's a major problem. There are efforts by the International Telecommunication Union, as well as by the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, IEEE. In fact, I was in a standards meeting yesterday talking on this topic. So we need this standardization effort to keep going on. It is extremely critical. And one of the major impediments to spectrum sharing technology innovation is the identification and creation of realistic outdoor test beds where experimentation can be done. This was very clearly stated by the industry and academia during the second national workshop conducted by the Wizard, the Wireless Spectrum R&D Steering Group at Berkeley Wireless Research Center in January 2012, which I also happen to co-chair. There are multiple Department of Defense wireless testing ranges, which are primarily focused on operational testing and classification requirements. There are also smaller non-DOD ranges, which are limited in their ability to enable real-world experimentation. And there are others in academia, which is basically performing experimentation in Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and Zigbee, which is not real life. We are talking about so many different bands and so many different kinds of equipments and applications, which need to share the spectrum. Now, since I was specifically asked by the subcommittee to provide some details on the Idaho National Lab, I would like to provide a quick brief. Idaho National Lab has an 890-mile wireless range facility for supporting this national effort. In April 2011, after visiting the INL wireless experimentation facility, the National Wireless Spectrum R&D Senior Steering Group commended that the Idaho National Laboratory represents a unique opportunity for unfettered development and testing of advanced spectrum using technologies in the nation. Doc, doctor, if you could wrap it up in 30 seconds, okay. that would be great. Thank sure. you. I'm almost there. Thank you. Thank you. Of particular note is the existence of the range of commercial equipments and a strong research team working on related research, executing on nationally important interoperability and other research experimentation. INL is making internal research investments on spectrum-related research. However, a comprehensive national plan will help laboratories like INL. Now, the third challenge, funding and collaboration support. The nation is, fund with, is faced with the spectrum crunch, yet there is currently insufficient funding to accelerate development as well as experimentation. Without technologies to validate spectrum sharing trust and security, it is not possible to build the required government industry support for collaboration. The recently enacted HR 3630 bill has recommended specific spectral bands, but it also needs to be augmented with sufficient funding, appropriate funding to conduct research and experimentation. In summary, the responsiveness of the nation to the spectrum trend challenge will have a significant bearing on economic growth and national security. The government has taken some important steps, but there's a long way to go in terms of a comprehensive national approach towards spectrum sharing, and as well as accelerated technology development and testing. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of our witnesses for their testimony. Reminding members that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. The chair will at this point open the round of question, and I recognize myself uh, for five minutes. Um, Mr. Gutman McCabe, in your testimony, you discuss how regulatory policies have a substantial impact on the ability and incentive for CTIA members to invest in new facilities and development of new technologies. Can you give us a sense of how these policies affect business decisions in the wireless industry? And also, if you could, can you share specific examples of regulatory policies that could be particularly harmful um, to your industry's research and development? Uh, certainly, and, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, the way we look at, at, at regulatory reform and regulatory issues is to sort of take a step back and take a 25,000-foot uh, approach and say, uh, you know, regulatory bodies should apply the physician's motto of first do no harm. There's been a lot of focus in the last couple years about removing outdated or no longer applied regulations. And uh, while that's beneficial, uh, if you overlay then, you know, a half dozen new regulations uh, and, and you take away regulations that weren't being in any way uh, implemented or, or enforced, there's still a net, a net negative. And, uh, you know, we represent carriers large and small. And when you look at, particularly from some of our smaller carriers' perspectives, when they have a, a dollar for, from a, a CapEx budget, and it has to go towards implementing uh, an FCC regulation, or on the other hand, it can go to moving towards LTE or upgrading their networks. Um, you know, they have a finite budget. I mean, all of our all of our members have finite budgets. So when we look at uh, regulation, we look at the cumulative impact of all of them. And there was an interesting um, 
a memorandum that just came out from Cass Sunstein that actually said exactly that, that said you can't, while, while a regulation on its face may look logical, when you look at the cumulative impact of all of the regulations, that new regulation may in and of itself may not be logical. And that, that's part of what we hope sort of Congress provides a little oversight to the regulatory bodies is it's not just each individual regulation that at times may seem logical. It's the cumulative impact when you have finite capital resources. Um, I think that's key. And then from our perspective, another one is just, just providing the environment for, for research and development investments, uh, extending the R&D tax credit. It's a constant fight each year to try to extend it. Um, we used to be number one in the world. We're 27th now. Okay. So, so that's, a, that's, that's an area where there could be great help. Okay, thank you very much. And, and Ms. Brown, you state that without the market opportunity presented by additional radio spectrum for broadband, our country's uh, technolog technological leadership is going to really stagnate and we could have huge economic and social benefits not fully realized. How are the other regions dealing with this? How's the EU and, uh, and the Asian Pacific Rim um, making spectrum available? Well, they had, uh, in Europe, for example, they had the advantage of, uh, of not having allocated spectrum, large swath of spectrum at 2.5, uh, and have recently opened that uh, more than 100 megahertz of spectrum, uh, which, uh, given the timing by which they have uh, released it, is going to become immediately available for advanced mobile broadband technologies. And similarly, there's similar sorts of actions in, in Asia PAC. Now, the reason I made that statement in, in my testimony is that because we have continually had radio spectrum in our pipeline for advancing technologies here in the U.S., this has become the locus, this country has become the place where these technologies are developed. Even global companies that are headquartered in Europe or elsewhere, they come here to do the development because this has been the, the center of mobile broadband and mobile technologies. Um, if we no longer have those market opportunities, our carriers are not able to advance. Um, there are now plenty of spectrum opportunities in Europe and Asia PAC, and these uh, development centers could, uh, could migrate over time outside of the U.S., which would be a shame. Thank you. And, and with Cisco's virtual networking index, um, the projects that, that the volume projects that the volume of traffic on mobile service provider networks will increase 16 times mm -hmm. from now until 2016. Uh, how has Cisco and other technology companies um, increased efficiencies, improved technologies, and addressed rising demand through innovative research uh, and development? So let me speak to Cisco and the tech sector generally. Um, through every layer and every corner of service provider networks, there are new technologies being deployed to try to address this right now. So from Cisco's perspective, uh, network management technologies that enable the carriers to better balance their traffic loads um, so that they can spread the traffic out uh, among cell sites. Uh, Cisco has also been at the forefront of Wi-Fi and femtocell offloading that many of the carriers are aggressively moving to to try to get the traffic off the mobile spectrum and onto unlicensed spectrum. But you can go on and on. The chipset manufacturers are producing more efficient chipsets. The base station and antenna people are producing ever more efficient uh, equipment. LTE itself is an example of a much more efficient technology than the 3G technologies mm -hmm. that, that preceded it. So it's going on at every level in every tech company that, that services service providers, mobile service providers. So we're making great progress, but as Mr. Bennett stated in his testimony, we're just not there yet in terms of being able to use overlapping set spectrum for, for different communications. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And, and before I uh, recognize Ms. Edwards, I am in the middle of two other markups, just like many other people. So I apologize if I have to leave. Um, and I want to thank you all for your testimony. And I recognize Ms. Edwards for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. I just have one question because you all seem to um, sh to indicate uh, that we need to repurpose or reallocate spectrum for uh, commercial use. And just as I was sitting here, I'm a big Turner Classic movie fan, and one of my favorites is Pillow Talk with Doris Day, the party line, Rock Hudson on the other end. Um, and I can recall, probably showing my age, recall us having a, a party line. Uh, when I was growing up, and uh, clearly we don't want to live in an age where if we're forced to share, then it means that it disrupts our ability to use 
um, and have broadband access when we want it and when we need it. We've become too accustomed uh, to that kind of rapid access. Uh, but what I'm curious about, and Dr. Subramanian notes um, in, your, in your testimony that repurposing is only going to be a short-term solution. It's not a long-term solution. And the uh, risk of having to share a spectrum in the long run still remains. And so my question is, what is it that both the government and industry can do to ramp up uh, technology and innovation in the sector so that, you know, in the meantime, while we're reallocating and repurposing, which we have to do, that in the long run, we're not going to find ourselves not just in a crunch anymore because we will have reallocated ad nauseum, but without the ability to meet the, the needs that all of us will have to expect um, rapid up to the moment uh, information. And so I wonder if you have some comments about that, about what the federal government can do and what the private sector needs to do to, um, to step up research and development around sharing technologies. Um, maybe start with Dr. Bennett. Just Mr. Mr. Bennett. Just Mr. Bennett. Uh, okay, well, we'll make you a doctor later on, but we'll start with Mr. Bennett. Right honorary now. degree. Huh? Uh, one of the first things that the government can do is actually focus on repurposing or redesigning government applications, where government is actually an operator of networks, is often in the case with uh, the defense networks and several others. Uh, those applications can be reconfigured to, to use commercial network commercial networks and also commercial networking technologies. In the public safety network, we go part of the way there <clears throat> that we embrace a commercial technology, but we still retain the government's role as, as, a, as a network operator. One of the things that's important to realize about this whole repurposing uh, problem issue is that there's really no downside. Say we could all be completely wrong and there's no spectrum crunch. But there's no downside to acting on the assumption that it is real and updating the applications and replacing the equipment that was installed 20 years ago to run these applications a certain way with more modern equipment that, that takes more better advantage of, of the technologies that we have right now. Thank you. And um, perhaps we can hear from Dr. Subramanian. First of all, I guess in my personal opinion, uh, we have started a little bit late on this whole spectrum crunch issue. Now, what has led to that is there is hardly any spectrum to allocate new, so which means we need to devise methods of either repurposing or sharing before it can be allocated to the industry. And there are efforts going on, as we talked about. Um, now, on the industry front, Carriers, the leading carriers, as, as you all might know, they have already removed the unlimited data plans. If you're re going now, you had to pay f minimum $50 to get two gigahertz. And potentially, because of this crunch, and this has been very clearly stated by one of the CEOs of the leading carriers, that you know I don't have spectrum, I'm going to keep on increasing the cost of this. So the cost of the spectrum usage is going to increase. That's one thing they're doing. The other thing they are also trying to do is using Wi-Fi or using femtocell-like technologies to offload the traffic to landline. So that's, it can go only so much so far. Now, if you look at the OEMs or the industry that is supporting the carriers, they are trying to build new LTE advanced or the next generation technology to optimize the efficiency of spectrum usage. So these things have to go on in parallel. And in my guesstimate, it takes at least about you know, four to five years before technologies can be formed, tested, and deployed. So somehow, the next four, four to five years, the industry has to keep on making these small increments. So could we hear from maybe Ms. Brown, I mean, what is it that we could do that would, you know, sort of spur uh, Cisco and, you know, others in the, um, in the industry to ramp up their R&D capacity? Well, I, I think from the perspective of a manufacturer, there's already very strong profit motives on, in the private sector to engage in R&D in this area. Our customers are basically demanding that uh, we create technologies that are going to enable them to be more efficient from a spectrum uh, capacity. So I'm not sure from a private sector perspective there's a stronger motive than that. But there are things, and there are, I think, things that, that – that the federal government can do, and there is a role for government here. Um, so things like basic research um, of the type we heard from from NIST on cognitive radio, 
um, improving, as Richard Bennett said, improving federal radio systems, uh, which were designed many of them decades ago in a siloed environment where there was no, uh, no thought given to uh, being uh, good neighbors uh, from a spectrum perspective. And then, uh, as Dr. Subramanian said, uh, test beds are important. Um, one of the things we've learned from the very limited uh, experience so far we've had in Wi-Fi sharing with federal radar systems, it's very important to develop a level of trust if you're going to have commercial and federal uh, sharing spectrum. The, 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 but both sides need to know that the investments they make and the services that they're offering are going to uh, continue to happen uh, when sharing starts. And it's things like test beds that enable you to build that level of trust. So funding those sorts of activities as well is important. Thank you. My time's run out. Mr. Chairman. The chair recognizes Mrs. Biggert. Gentlelady from Illinois for five years, five minutes. <laughs> I don't know if I've got five years of questions. <laughs> uh, thank I made you, a mistake <laughs> yesterday and cut a gentleman short, and uh, now I'm overly generous. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I've got an iPad, I mean, a, a, a Blackberry. What do you even call it? And a smartphone, and an iPad, and a, and a Kindle. What's bothering me is particularly with, with this one, the Blackberry, I see everybody on the house floor with it and standing in the back and I always ask them if they're talking to each other because nobody's talking to talking anymore. I really worry that the art of conversation is going to be gone, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Um, and Dr. Subramanian, uh, could you describe your, your work on NIDR D? Uh, uh, I'm particularly interested in the steering group's role in coordinating and informing uh, ongoing uh, spectrum R&D activities across the government as well as identification of the shortcomings in the government's R&D portfolio with respect to the technologies that allow more efficient use of the spectrum. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, essentially, I think the first and foremost is to understand where is the national R&D money being spent, especially by the government agencies. and then. Uh, to understand are there any national testing facilities that really exist where both the government and the industry can really collaborate and, uh, and work together. So on the first thing, we went to all the agencies. There are 16 agencies which are a part of the United Tree Wizard Group. We went to all, the, all of them and said, hey, you know, where is your money going, including DARPA, NSF, uh, DOD, DHS, all those. And where is your R&D portfolio going on? And they came up with a list of portfolio and the list of research that is happening. In. And then we conducted, and we did the same thing for test beds. What are the test beds, where it is, what are the characteristics and features? Then we coordinated two national uh, working group meetings, uh, one in Boulder uh, last year in June, and then one in Berkeley in January. The first meeting we discussed, hey, this is, these are the R&D areas that the government has been working on. Industry, where are you working on? Is this all useful? And are there gaps that you want to do? And then apparently it so happens that, you know, whatever I kind of uh, alluded to in the testimony, that the industry is really focused on the near-term return on investments, especially on a spectrum sharing perspective. So there is effort going on on the government side, but there is a significant amount of research that needs to happen on sensing, policy, data processing, uh, spectrum um, uh, databases and stuff. There is an extensive amount of uh, research that needs to happen, and as Mrs. Brown also mentioned, everyone said we need experimentation facility which needs to be recognized and invested. Great. Thank you. Then uh, what, what, and this is whoever wants to answer this question or all, what's the best strategy to ensure U.S. leadership in, in spectrum technology development and innovation? Uh, Mr. Bennett? <clears throat> yeah, I think the best way we can win that race is to beat the other countries in investing in research. And basic research is one of, is the thing that really ultimately drives all of this. And the United States used to have a wonderful position in basic research because we had Bell Labs, a, an institution that wasn't had no parallel anywhere else in the world. And that's Bell Labs. I mean, still exists in name, but it's it's not just not what it was. And that gap in basic research funding really can only be filled by the government. The commercial sector is doing a great job on the applied research side, although they could, they could use some help there too. But 
Fundamentally, it's, it's from the basic research, we go to the standards committees, and from the standards committees, we go to the commercial products. And so it, it really all begins with the research. Thank you. Congressman, um, I, I, mm -hmm. if I may, I would also add, um, you know, we, I had the, the, the privilege of going to Dallas last week and met with six of our members, all who have R&D facilities in the Dallas area. And as we went back and looked, uh, our members have about 87 labs in the United States doing R&D. So, uh, Ms. Brown talked about. I mean, there's a lot of incentive on the private sector side to do this, um, but but we do need to make sure that we make bringing spectrum to market a priority. If we do that, this will continue to be the hub for those R&D facilities. M almost every one of those companies is a multinational company that has chosen to locate their R&D facilities here to bring those jobs, to bring those revenues here. Um, but, but it's sort of chicken and egg. Uh, part of it is because we've led uh, the, the, the spectrum position for quite some time and we've managed to get the networks out there first. Um, but, but there does need to be, we understand that sharing is significant part of the equation, but there are other very developed countries like Germany and the UK and Italy and France, uh, Japan that have standing armies and, and similar uh, sort of environments that we do that are bringing hundreds and hundreds of megahertz of spectrum to market. So, so our, our argument is uh, we can't fall behind them or we will lose a lot, including the R&D uh, test bed facilities that we have. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Super, Superman. There are two things I want to point out. Now, if you look at the first generation, second generation of the wireless technologies, United States had more than 80 percent, which means you're really controlling the global supply chain. But when you come to LTE, United States has less than 40 percent of the patents, and then there is an increasing number of patents in China as well as in Europe. So that's a caution number one, that there is a lot to be done. The second thing is we asked the same question to the industry in Berkeley. Hey, you know, what do you want to do? How can we help? The first thing they said is identify the spectral bands where the research needs to happen. Second thing is bring those government agencies who are deploying the applications currently to the table so that we can collaborate and test in a common place. So this needs to happen immediately. And I think the HR bill that has recently been released will definitely help in the right direction to go there. Great, thank you. And I know this committee always stresses basic science and research and will continue to do that. I wish all of our members would would get the joke. <laughs> Thank you. Yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Recognize Ms. Bonamici from the state of Oregon for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, all of you, for your uh, fascinating and important testimony. And I, I think I want to perhaps emphasize the importance. I know, uh, Ms. Brown, in, in your testimony, you, you mentioned that Cisco did not even consider tablets to be a device category a couple of years ago. And I think that's pretty staggering now as we, we look around us, and it just show, uh, shows how dynamic uh, and ever-changing the sector is. So, and I understand that the future, even the near future, is pretty hard to predict, but uh, a couple of you have mentioned in your testimony some emerging technologies that are on the horizon, and I know, Ms. Brown, you mentioned the machine, to machine communications. I, uh, I had the pleasure of seeing a demonstration and hearing a discussion out at a, a fairly large Intel facility in, in my district. And some of the work that they're doing with medical technology is very, very promising, but really raises, I think, the, uh, the, the issue of uh, the need for more spectrum. So uh, can you talk a little bit more about, uh, I know you mentioned that one example, other technologies and what that's going to mean for consumer demand, just so we can figure out how much teeth gnashing there is going to be. <laughs> yeah, so um, our study that we release every year, the Visual Networking Index, is uh, basically our attempt to look five years ahead and figure out what is going to happen on service provider networks from a traffic standpoint. What types of traffic are going to flow? What are the demands? And so on. And the purpose of that is so that Cisco can understand what we need to build because it takes time to construct everything um, uh, and meet that demand three, four, five years out. Um, so as we, as we get beyond the five-year time frame, it becomes a little murky in terms of trying to project what's going to happen. Um, but it's very clear from the evidence that we see today, which is from existing uh, measurements of traffic of carrier networks today, from analyst reports, and from the kinds of things that are sort of on the cusp in the standards organizations and what's happening, that we're about to see a transformation of the mobile internet from people to people to machine to machine, as well as people to machine and people to people. So 
It's a huge transformation and a pivot point for the industry, um, and it's going to start happening over the next five years. So it's putting incredible demands on spectrum. Anybody else care to opine about looking into the future and what, what we can expect? Yeah, you know, if I may add to what uh, you've been telling and uh, Ms. Brown has been telling, let's take every economic sector, every key economic sector which is going to define the economic growth of this nation. Let's talk about energy sector. AMA, advanced metering systems and all SCADA systems, the whole energy grid for a significant amount is going to be dependent on right. wireless. Now look at advanced transportation systems, electric charging, infotainment, safety, everything is going to become wireless. So now, we are, now you, you can talk about advanced manufacturing systems, um, and the, the Wall Street and the financial industry is going to be heavily dependent on this. Now you're talking about adding every economic sector, then you see the whole dependence on the economy, uh, a, a significant technology dependence, I should say, on wireless technologies. Thank you very much. And I wanted to follow up on the last set of uh, questions uh, and ask about, uh, I know, uh, Dr. Subramanian, that you mentioned that the need, the demand is increasing, not just here, but in the EU and Singapore, China, uh, and that they're aggressively seeking some innovative solutions. And I wonder if you could describe how our efforts compare uh, as we're attempting to address this crunch, and can we learn any lessons? I know that, uh, Mr. Bennett, you talked about the investment in R&D, but uh, how do we compare and can we learn anything from the, the, you said, innovative solutions that are being pursued in other areas? Okay, um, now let's talk about European Union. Now, European Union has created a large-scale testbed where all the countries and all the vendors can have a common playground. Now you think about so many of these vendors supporting the ecosystem, having a common place where they're able to generate and develop new technologies. There is also uh, efforts going on to measure the spectrum at different places and create a common database which can be used to deploy certain kind of architectures for spectrum sharing. Similar effort in Singapore. Singapore is trying to aggregate all the needs of the neighboring countries as well as its own. Now what happens is they get the patents. So the more and more patents go out to the world, you are now, your economy or our economy, American economy, starts paying a premium on these technologies. And we don't want that to happen. So that's the critical issue we are in right now. Thank you. I, I'm just going to yield back uh, my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for yielding back. Chair recognizes Mr. Hultgren from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. I apologize. A busy afternoon, uh, several different committees meeting and, and other things. So I uh, apologize I haven't been able to be a part of uh, all this discussion, but uh, definitely appreciate uh, you being here. This is a very important topic that we need to be talking about. just have a couple questions. First of all, I would ask if any of you have some uh, thoughts on this. I know in uh, Dr. Altoff's testimony, you described uh, some of the work that NIST is conducting uh, to Im improve emergency responder communications, such as uh, wireless systems, metrology program, uh, to measure distortions in difficult radio environments. Uh, this technology certainly will be very beneficial to uh, the public safety community. I'm curious as to uh, whether you think this research uh, would also be helpful in other commercial applications uh, of wireless communication. And I just wondered if any of you have any thoughts about how this research could be used to help commercial communications. If I, if I could, um, there is a direct tie between any, any sort of test bed that we use to, to uh, verify the uh, validity or the, the robustness of, a, of an emergency communication system like that actually produces immediate benefits for the consumer because we no longer really have these, these technologies. They're no longer stovepipe the way they used to be. So in one of the, one of the comments that, that was made in connection with the White House's inquiry into the public safety network, one of the uh, public, uh, one of the police, uh, police chiefs, I, I believe it was, made the comment that the average 16-year-old in the United States has better communications capability than the average policeman does. Well, there's a reason for that, right? The 16-year-old is using a system that was that's the, the product of hundreds of billions of dollars of investment in basic research and R&D and chip development, as well as testing, whereas the average policeman today is using a system that was custom built for a, a relatively small market, you know, some time ago when, when the technology was just not as well developed as it is. So there's a great benefit to standardization. 
uh, which is why so you know the the uh, the standards bodies that develop you know the Wi-Fi standards and the 4G and and LTE standards that that's where all the research uh, comes together. So so people all over the world are doing research. Everyone wants to be the next uh, Qualcomm that has the patents on CDMA that have you know proved to be so so valuable because they're universally deployed and. The, the test beds are part of the process to, to sort through the competing proposals and decide what the standard is going to be. I mean, we can't, we're not really in a position in the United States, in the commercial or, or government sector, anywhere else, to really make our own decisions about technology now. We pretty much have to go with the standards because the, the arguments for doing that are so compelling. The requirements for the public safety network are so demanding the ability to operate under the most severe environmental conditions, uh, under conditions where the, the, the data load will be intense uh, in, under really serious circumstances, uh, the ability to be uh, ultra secure, um, the ability for literally thousands and tens of thousands of disparate organizations to utilize the same network. All of those are pushing us towards newer technologies and newer solutions, and all of those will inevitably lead to uh, solutions perhaps unforeseen at this time that will be useful to the commercial sector. Mr. Bennett, uh, if I can ask a quick question, get your thoughts. Uh, with expected massive uh, increase in internet data transmission in the near future and uh, also anticipated reliance on wireless technology, is it possible that uh, broadband spectrum availability will constrain other computing technologies such as cloud computing? And uh, what potential solutions are there to this uh, problem? Well, we need to solve the uh, the spectrum crunch, you know, once and for all. And I think the way that we do that is by. And I alluded to this in my in my oral testimony. It's also in my written statement. Development of technologies like spatial division, multiple access, and multi-user MIMO that allow multiple people, multiple data streams, to actually occupy the same frequency at the same time. And that that pretty well when those are fully developed uh, you know, there's no more spectrum crunch but it it certainly is the case that the the by constraining you know, the bandwidth that we have available for the for emerging applications like augmented mobile reality which is directly related to the cloud then the cloud can't really develop until the users of, of augmented mobile reality can exchange video streams with the cloud processing systems. And so, yeah, it's, it's a, a crucial building block. I mean, what application developers will use whatever spectrum's available to them, whatever bandwidth is available to them, they'll use it. And if it's only enough for narrow band, fairly unimaginative applications, then that's what we'll have. My, my time is up, but real quickly, uh, just following up, Mr. Bennett, wh when do you think some of that might happen, some of that next advancement of technology? Any guess? I mean, is that in the next few years? Is that the next decades? I think we're going to start to see really dramatic changes probably within the next 10 years. It could be, could be sooner than that. Network effects are, it's, it's really always difficult to take a revolutionary new technology and introduce it into the marketplace because there's so much momentum around the existing systems. but. I'd say uh, as soon as five years and, and as, at worst case, probably 20 to 30. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I yield back. All right, gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes Ms. Edwards for whatever time she wants to consume. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. He promised me five years, so you all will be here for a while. Um, just a, one question here, and it goes to um, a reference in uh, Dr. Subramanian's testimony uh, where he mentioned that the industry is focused on supporting the deployment of 4G technology and isn't ready to invest in spectrum sharing, research, and development. And I'm curious as to what can be done to encourage more active involvement by industry in this area. And it goes to uh, another point that was made, I think, uh, Mr. Gutman, in your testimony, uh, where you talked about um, focusing on repurposing and reallocation as opposed to other newer technologies around spectrum sharing. And I'm just trying to get a handle uh, on, on this question of what it means for the consumer. Because if we reallocate and use as much spectrum as there is available and it is a finite resource, then at some point or other the c consumer is like paying through the nose 
uh, for, uh, for data. And that may not happen right now, but it is increasingly. And so I'm trying to figure out what the incentive is for the industry um, to make investments in this existing technology because it isn't just about the consumer demand because I can imagine an environment where when none of the big carriers moves to invest where you would just say well you know consumer demand they pay more uh, for what's available what's then the incentive for the uh, for the industry sure and so mr. Gutman can you help yeah. me with that yeah um, I, I, I think the clearest way to address this is almost to to bifurcate the effort uh, to look at what can be done in the short term to address this um, this conflict between supply and demand. Um, and I think you only need to look at the back row behind me. I'm not sure they're still back there. But all those young folks, when they first came in, uh, I came in front of, uh, right behind many of them through security. Every single one of them had at least one device. And so what we're looking at, and I think Ms. Brown referenced this, is what's in the pipeline in terms of spectrum resources? And there really isn't anything. And we are unique in the developed world in that, in that sense. So we've got to focus on getting something in the pipeline now that is usable now. Um, and, and so when I talk about uh, sort of real-time sharing or um, opportunistic use, I think everyone agrees that that is the long-term solution, except for every panel I've been on in front of Congress, at the President's PCAST, everyone has said there's not a solution that is available or scalable yet. And so how do we get to that, how do we bridge that time frame between now and Mr. Bennett's 5, 10, 30 years? And, and from our perspective, it's let's, let's focus again in the short term, having, having our government uh, you know, um, officials focus on repurposing the spectrum that's available. Um, we looked at the, at the broadcasters uh, for every 100 megahertz that they use, 190 are not being used. So how do we drive efficiencies from that? Um, how do we drive efficiencies from some of the government uses? There's, there are microwave uses in, in bands that just do not need to be there. Um, so how can we drive out some of those efficiencies, bring it to market? At the same time, you heard Ms. Brown say that they have every incentive to move to solutions that drive efficiency. Uh, when we were in Dallas last week, uh, one of our largest manufacturers, who's one of the largest in the world, said every single wireless solution that they've employed around the world was developed in the United States. So I hope that, that the takeaway from here is not that the United States is, is not doing its part. Uh, that's why we're seeing multinational companies move their R&D facilities here into the United States. Um, but, but there does need to be some focus on sort of some of the longer term solutions. My point is we can't say that that is the gold standard now when it currently doesn't exist. It is a, it is a wonderful absolutely necessary aspiration to get to it, and it will solve a tremendous amount of the problems, but once it's available, and, and there are people so spending great deals of money on that. Thank great you, deal of money. and because my time is running out, so I just want to be clear. Um, from your industry perspective, reallocate, repurpose for the short term invest in the R&D and the technology and the development for the long term. And so, Dr. Uh, Mr. Bennett, uh, Dr. Otloff, are we making enough of an investment in basic research from the federal government to support the long-term activities that have to take place in R&D? Probably not. Just say it for the microphone. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly, uh, NIST has sufficient uh, resources to be addressing the problems that we're working on right now, and the uh, proposed uh, uh, initiative in the President's 13 budget will go a long way towards helping us uh, address some of the new measurement needs that are being, that all these new technologies will be uh, needing. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, Mr. Lipinski, the gentleman from Illinois, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, qu quick question. The question that people, I go home, people will want to know the answer to. Um, is there going to be a point, maybe you feel like it's happening now, but are, it, is there going to be a point where the uh, spectrum crunch causes a um, noticeable uh, drop off in service? That's what, that's what yeah, I, I talk about this at home. I mean, people just want to know, okay, so what, what's it going to do to me? What am I going to, what impact am, am I going to feel? So I, I just wanted to hear what, um, uh, 
any of you uh, want to want to say about that? So okay, let's start out on the right uh, right side and go across. Yeah, I, I mentioned this uh, sometime back here. If you look at the major carriers, they have already removed the unlimited data plans. So a minimum now you have to pay a fifty dollars. I I used to pay for my BlackBerry twenty nine ninety nine for unlimited data plan uh, from Verizon, and now if anyone wants to get a new data plan, you just get two gigahertz for fifty dollars. And this is going to be increasing more and more. Now, added to this, there is going to be quality of service issues. There is going to be drop call issues. And things are going to go slow. And if this continues in four or five years, even to look at Facebook is going to be very difficult. But is that, on that first part, is that a spectrum issue? Or is that, well, if I had one of these companies, I could raise my prices, I'd raise my prices. Is it, is it that, or is it is the spectrum issue? There? At least the CEO of one of the major carriers has said it is a spectrum issue, and the government needs to act. Yes, it's a spectrum issue. Um, all of the major uh, carriers have discussed this in various respects. And the thing to understand about it is it's going to hit, the, the, the impact to consumers is going to hit Geographically, it's going to be different, and by carrier, it's going to be different, depending on how much spectrum they have in the cupboard that they can bring out to address it. Um, so the major metropolitan areas, New York City, um, even San Francisco, when I go back to Cisco's corporate headquarters in San Jose, uh, when you're driving down the 101 to San Jose, it's very hard to get a connection that actually doesn't drop or, uh, or have some issue with trying to get connectivity. So we're already starting, the, sort of the, the early hints of it are here. The Federal Communications Commission said they think that we're going to start seeing that more in a broad way next year um, if additional spectrum is So is this something that is going to happen sort of slowly and just get more and more aggravating? And so not something that's going to, unfortunately, yeah. a lot of times up here on uh, Capitol Hill, we don't do anything until there's a crisis or a big sharp drop off somehow but uh yes uh, yeah. congressman we um we coined the term looming spectrum crisis in part to get the attention of of uh you as leaders because because you know that's the only way to exactly <laughs> i didn't say that um but th but that was that we tried to find a way to to identify it in a very succinct very easily to un easy to understand way and and i think um, again, I've spent an inordinate amount of time defending whether, in fact, there is a looming spectrum crunch or crisis. And I keep saying, you know, if this is a conspiracy, it's a global conspiracy because every country is addressing this issue. And, and when we talk about the area where we've fallen behind, that's one area where we've fallen behind. You look at the countries that I, that I listed earlier, the closest one has a third of our population, you know, Japan. I mean, you look at Germany, the UK, Italy, France, South Korea, they've all identified hundreds and hundreds of megahertz. Some of them have brought it to market. And, and they've done it because they don't want to see that impact. They don't want to see carriers taking steps to try to drive down usage of their product. Uh, and they do want to see this explosion in verticals, whether it's M Health or uh, smart education or intelligent transportation. I mean, we're seeing sort of the, the movement of wireless into so many sectors, and it's fantastic, and yet at the same time, it could be concerning if we don't begin to address both short and long term this concern about the lack of spectrum in the pipeline. Yeah, the spectrum crunch hit San Francisco in 2007 with, when the, uh, the iPhone took off and every hipster in town had to have one. And San Francisco has this unique policy where they really don't like to issue zoning permits for new towers. And so without spectrum, you know, it's, it's, you know there's two solutions, right? There's either more spectrum or more towers. And if you, you can't get the towers and you don't have the spectrum, then what happens is, you know, uh, the hipsters can't have their iPhones. I mean, now, now that they got... Uh, you, now you've hit the, the key here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but now they've got Sprint, so maybe you know, maybe with Sprint and Verizon having the iPhone, you know, the 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 people of San Francisco, some of whom are hipsters, but not all, uh, will you know, will be able to enjoy that. Yeah, so, so you know, um, personally, I don't think I'll be very upset if I cannot see the Facebook on my smartphone. My 11-year-old daughter might be, but I think the key point is this nation has progressed. The economy has grown through innovation in various sectors. 
and the fundamental dependency of different sectors of the economy to grow, for example, the smart grid, the advanced transportation systems, the medical systems, advanced manufacturing systems, they are all extremely dependent, which means the job creation capability of this nation is heavily dependent on what is the spectrum usage and how effectively we can use it. So that's the fundamental problem. I'm glad you brought it back to that because that, um, w w when we, we get down to where we're talking about the um, conveniences in, in, in good, um, you know, devices is important, but uh, the bottom line, the final bottom line is uh, this is about, uh, you know, economic, economic growth. Uh, so thank you very much, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, <coughs> I have uh, just a brief uh, something I'd like to put in the record. Uh, spectrum policy has been discussed at length this Congress, and there's been a dramatic increase in demand on spectrum in recent years. And to meet this demand, there are those who argue the need for the new technologies and more efficient use of spectrum. Uh, we also hear the argument from others that unleashing new spectrum through spectrum auctions is the solution to so-called, quote, spectrum crunch, unquote. An article appeared in the New York Times today uh, and uh, which highlighted these various opinions and detailed issues of surrounding spectrum use and the wireless economy. I'd like to ask unanimous consent that this article be put in, entered into the record and without objection, it is so ordered. And I will say now to you, nobody else here, don't judge our interest and our appreciation of your appearance here today by empty chairs because all these people have at least three places they ought to be right now. And uh, we're thankful that they came, gave us as much time as they could. But we know you took time to prepare yourself and it takes time to give this testimony. And we're very grateful to you because you're helping us solve something that's almost insolvable. Uh, uh, thank you for your valuable te testimony and thank the members for their questions. And the members of the committee might have some additional questions uh, for you and we'll ask you all to respond to those if you will. Uh, and the record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and, and statements from members. Uh, the witnesses are excused. Thank all of you for coming. This hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.